Behind every great movie is a great studio, and behind every great studio is a visionary. Studio Ghibli is actually behind several great movies, and their most well-known creative mastermind is Hayao Miyazaki. But he's not the only driving force. Hey everyone, I'm Adrian with Channel Frederator, and if you've never heard of the groundbreaking Studio Ghibli, just imagine a Japanese Disney or Pixar, kinda. We've already done 107 fact videos of some of their films, My Neighbor Totoro, Princess Mononoke, and Spirited Away. So if you want to learn more, definitely check out those videos too. But today we're looking at the studio itself. The of the three passionate co-founders to create art their way and the rewards they reaped, including multiple awards and a museum. So grab your animator hat as we count down 107 facts about Studio Ghibli. Let's get started. Fact number one, Studio Ghibli Inc. is an award-winning animated film studio based in Kogane, Tokyo in Japan, which was founded in 1985. Number two, the studio was founded by animators Hayao Miyazaki and Isao Takahata and producer Toshio Suzuki. Remember those names because they're all important. Many of the themes and practices employed in Studio Ghibli's movies come from the personal experiences of these three, particularly Miyazaki. Number three, they produced 20 films since their founding, beginning with Laputa, Castle in the Sky in 1986, and most recently when Marnie was there in 2014. There was Nausicaa too, but that was before they were officially founded. Number 4. Ghibli comes from humble origins. The original studio Ghibli office was located on the first floor of a house in the suburbs of Tokyo. Number 5. In the beginning, nobody expected Studio Ghibli to last very long, much less 30 years. They approached each film with a mindset of, if this succeeds, we'll make another one. If this flops, we out. Number 6. Studio Ghibli is primarily focused on creating movies for its Japanese audience. International releases are the gravy on top of the animation potatoes. Number 7. While Studio Ghibli is a very Japan-centric company, Company, there are definitely foreigners in the office, especially Italians. Number 8. Studio Ghibli has a strict no alterations policy when it comes to the distribution of their movies. This is a result of what happened in their very first film together, Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind, which was torn apart for the American release and retitled Warriors of the Wind. In fact, Suzuki's official stance on the matter is, let's not talk about that version, okay? Number 9. Here's how serious Ghibli is about that zero alterations policy. During negotiations for Princess Mononoke, Suzuki sent American producer Harvey Weinstein a samurai sword with a note that read, no cuts. But wait, isn't a samurai sword for cutting? Number 10. The former chief executive officer of Ghibli, Toru Hara, said that Ghibli ran using the three H's, high cost, high risk, and high return. In other words, anything good takes a lot of work and a lot of luck. Number 11. The name Ghibli is actually a word used by Italian pilots that refers to a hot wind blowing through the Sahara Desert. It's also the name of an aircraft, the Caproni CA-309 Ghibli. Miyazaki took his name for the studio because he wanted to blow a sensational wind into the Japanese world of animation, and that he did. Number 12. The original the word Ghibli is pronounced with a hard G instead of a soft G used by the studio. Supposedly, this was Miyazaki's pronunciation error, and it just stuck. I mean, if you romanize the katakana in the studio's title cards, it would read out Jiburi or Jibri. Number 13. Miyazaki's father ran a company that manufactured fighter plane tail fins during World War II. Hayao became entranced by the process and the way all the parts connected, leading to his love of planes. Number 14. Miyazaki's mother, on the other hand, contracted spinal tuberculosis and was bedridden for nine years between 1947 and 1955. Yao drew on this experience when creating My Neighbor Totoro, which includes a mother with a long-term illness. Number 15. Since he was a boy, Miyazaki idolized mangaka Osamu Tezuka, who inspired him to become a mangaka himself. However, Miyazaki's view of Tezuka became sour after Miyazaki realized that Tezuka's manga were just versions of Tezuka himself. Miyazaki actually burned all of his own sketches when he realized they started to look like Tezuka's work. Number 16. Miyazaki is also a fan of the Fleischer brothers, who are best known for Betty Boop, Popeye the Sailor, and the OG Superman cartoon. He paid tribute to them in Porco Rosa, with a movie Porco is watching. Number 17. The first animation Miyazaki saw was Hakuja Den, or The Great White Snake, in 1958. He was instantly captivated, and that was when he first got into animation. Number 18. When he first started drawing, Miyazaki didn't know how to draw people. He only drew planes and battleships, but he was aware that drawing people was essential to break into the field, so he started studying the human form. Number 19. Nowadays, Miyazaki is a professional people watcher. In public, he observes people's quirks and mannerisms, and later applies them to his work. As a result, Suzuki jokes that none of Miyazaki Miyazaki's work is original. It's all based on his observations. Number 20. Miyazaki became famous for animation, but he actually has a degree from Gakushun University in economics and political science. And his final thesis was on Japanese industry. He's a scholar and an animator. Number 21. He was also a member of the Children's Literature Research Club at school, which was apparently the closest thing his school had to the comics or manga club. Number 22. After graduating, Miyazaki began work at Toei Animations. After a few months of training, he was put into his first movie ever, Watchdog Bow Wow. Number 23. Let's shift gears 
careers for a second. Studio Ghibli co-founder Isao Takahata began his career looking to be a director, not an animator. He graduated from Tokyo University, which was the most prestigious school in Japan, and immediately started working at Toy Animations, which was still a new studio in 1959. Number 24. In 1965, Miyazaki and Takahata, both working at Toei, teamed up to work on The Prince of the Sun, which sort of makes it a proto-Ghibli film. Feeling like this would be their last feature film project before TV took over, they swore to put everything they had into the production. Number 25. Their hard work paid off and The Prince of the Sun was a massive hit is what you'd think would come next. But no, it was actually a flop, and Takahata was even demoted because of its failure. Fortunately, this did not break up the Miyazaki-Takahata partnership, and they went on to work on projects like Lupin the Third and Panda Go Panda together. Number 26. During their time at Toei Animation, Takahata and Miyazaki were already making history. One series, called Haiti, was animated by Miyazaki and directed by Takahata, and went on to be a landmark show in the East, drawing Japanese tourists to see the Swiss Alps. Number 27. Takahata and Miyazaki came to realize that the limitations of time Time and budget in television were too much to make everything worthwhile. They wanted to make something that had an impact and really emotionally delivered. This was what first inspired them to move away from TV and make their own movie. The first unofficial Studio Ghibli movie, Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. Number 28. Miyazaki and Takahata's first pitches to Tokuma Publishing in 1981 were for a Sengoku period piece called Warring States Demon Castle. It was an adaptation of Corbin's Rolf. Number 29. Both were shot down because distributors only wanted to make properties based on existing manga. So in 1982, Miyazaki launched a Nausicaa manga and Animeju magazine. Very clever. Number 30. At the time, Miyazaki made an agreement with Animeju magazine that he would not turn Nausicaa into a movie. Um, yeah, so about that. Number 31. When Tokuma Publishing finally approached Miyazaki about turning Nausicaa into a movie, Miyazaki had one condition. His good pal Takahata had to produce it, and produce it he did. Number 32. Now to introduce the third pillar of Ghibli, Toshio Suzuki. He was the editor-in-chief at Animeju magazine, owned by Tokuma Publishing. Suzuki became part of the production team working on Nausicaa. Number 33. While fundraising for Nausicaa, Suzuki was still fairly inexperienced. He assumed that they needed about three times more money than they actually did, which, hey, is better than three times too little. Number 34. Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind ended up doing well at the box office and was critically praised as well. As a result of its success, Tokuma Shoten Publishing helped kickstart Studio Ghibli. Number 35. Even after completing the Nausicaa movie, Miyazaki still continued the Nausicaa manga all the way until 1994. Number 36. Studio Ghibli has a number of themes that have become production staples for them. The one closest to Miyazaki's heart? Flying scenes and planes. You now know about Miyazaki's background with flying machines, and he makes sure to remind you of it in nearly every movie he has his hands on. Number 37. According to Miyazaki, the idea that evil is a singular, destructible force is misguided, especially in life and politics. Therefore, a trademark quality of his movies is the shades of grey in which he paints his storylines and characters. Everyone's a bit good and a bit bad. Number 38. Studio Ghibli movies are also known for their leading female roles. Miyazaki Miyazaki's main explanation for this is that women have a deeper way of dealing with problems than just kill the bad guy, which serves Miyazaki's style of not really having bad guys. He also says that men tend to deal with things through words, whereas women deal with things through feelings. Number 39. When asked if there would be a female director at Ghibli, the producer of When Marnie Was There, Yoshiaki Nishimura, said that from a directing standpoint, women tend to be more realistic and men tend to be more idealistic. He later apologized for that comment, since it came off as saying women can't direct animation, which is a bit contrary to the morals shown in the movies. Number 40. Miyazaki films typically show things the way he wishes they were, rather than the way things actually are. He believes it's important to show positivity and hope, even when discussing serious and dark subject matters. Number 41. His manga, though, is totally different. Zaso Note deals with all the dark and sinful parts of humanity, like greed, violence, hatred, you know, all the dark stuff. Number 42. Before we make it seem like all of Miyazaki's motives are poetic and complex, let me tell you this one. Pigs. Miyazaki movies have pigs galore. Miyazaki often draws himself as a pig, and in Zaso Note, many of the characters are pigs too. Number 43. The Ghibli film Porco Rosso, which is Italian for Crimson Pig, is actually based on the Zaso Note manga. Number 44. Anyway, back to the history. After Nausicaa, Tokuma Publishing wanted another animated movie, preferably a Nausicaa sequel. Miyazaki and Takahata went to Yanagawa for inspiration and ended up creating an almost live action documentary about the town, which was filled with historical canals. It was fittingly called, you guessed it, The Story of Yanagawa's Canals. And that's how a major league animation studio 
studio created a live-action documentary, number 45. By 1986, Studio Ghibli had formed and released their first official film, Laputa, Castle in the Sky. It was another one written and directed by Miyazaki. Number 46. Miyazaki got the word Laputa from the Laputans of Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift, who had their heads in the clouds. What Miyazaki didn't realize though, and I apologize for my Spanish, is that Laputa actually translates to whore in Spanish, which is why the word was dropped in Spanish-speaking countries. Number 47. In these days of the company, they aimed to keep the budget low by hiring just 70 people to work on a film, and then dismissing them all at once when it finished. This is a standard practice in the industry, but not the usual system that Ghibli is known for. Number 48. Castle in the Sky did well, but not quite as well as Nausicaa. While Nausicaa drew in over 900,000 viewers, Castle in the Sky got over 700,000 seats filled. Number 49. The next Ghibli project on the slate was My Neighbor Totoro. However, Miyazaki was reluctant to pick the project up because 10 years earlier, the original pitch for the movie got rejected. Distributors weren't interested in 1950s Japan, they wanted another Nausicaa or Castle in the Sky. Number 50. Simultaneously, Suzuki made a deal with another distributor to do another movie based off the book Grave of the Fireflies. He knew while Miyazaki did Totoro, Takahata could do Fireflies, and they beat out two movies at the same time. Number 51. There's a notorious quote from Studio Ghibli history. Producer Tatsumi Yamashita was getting increasingly frustrated with Studio Ghibli's movie choices. When he heard that, on top of Totoro, they were picking up Grave of the Fireflies too, he exclaimed, as if ghosts weren't enough, you want a grave as well? Number 52. According to Suzuki, from a producer standpoint, the idea of teaming up Totoro with Fireflies was like teaming up E.T. and Forbidden Games. Wouldn't that be a pretty cool double feature? Number 53. Producing My Neighbor Totoro and Grave of the Fireflies at the exact same time was utter chaos for the studio, because they refused to let the quality of either film be diminished. It was basically a suicide mission, but the company knew that this was their chance of making it big. Number 54. Their hard work paid off and the movies were a massive hit is what you'd think would come next, but no. Ultimately, neither Totoro nor Grave of the Fireflies actually made it big in theaters, because their long production times caused them to miss the big summer blockbuster season. However, the films were critically acclaimed, which put Studio Ghibli on the map for further releases. Money isn't everything, you know. Number 55. Just kidding, money is great. Nearly two years after the release of Totoro, a toy manufacturer contacted Ghibli about turning Totoro into a stuffed animal. They agreed, and thanks to this move, they made bank on the doll sales, covering the loss in production costs. After that, they promptly set up a merchandising department so the next time, they'd identify marketing potential two years sooner. Number 56. Not only did Totoro become a stuffed animal, he became the company mascot too. Talk about an overnight success. Number 57. After the Firefly's Totoro fiasco, Ghibli began to focus on just one film at a time. This way, they avoid the madness of having multiple open productions, but it also causes them to sometimes go long periods of time without work after finishing a big movie. Number 58. Following Grave of the Fireflies, Takahata directed only yesterday, Pompoko and My Neighbors the Yamadas, and also served as the music director of Kiki and the producer of I Can Hear the Sea busy man. Number 59. There's a clear contrast between Takahata's movies and Miyazaki's movies. Takahata's are more realistic and sometimes experimental, whereas Miyazaki's have become increasingly fantastical. Number 60. In 1989, Studio Ghibli made Kiki's Delivery Service, based off the novel by Eiko Kadono. Miyazaki adapted the script, making some changes to the source material to fit the Ghibli mold. Number 61. The original plan was for Miyazaki to just produce the movie and leave the development to the studio's younger staff members, but Miyazaki was unhappy with the script they penned, so he took it over, which intimidated the director, who then backed out, transforming the project into another Miyazaki film. Number 62. Unfortunately, Miss Kadono wasn't thrilled with the Ghiblification of her novel. The original book is a fun collection of Kiki's encounters, whereas Miyazaki turned it into a more dramatic coming-of-age story. The project was almost scratched until Miyazaki and Suzuki invited her to the studio and convinced her to give her blessing. Number 63. Kiki's delivery service became Ghibli's first big box office hit, and was the number one film in Japan in 1989, with 2.6 64 million tickets sold. Good thing Miss Kadono gave her blessing. Number 64. Prior to Kiki, Suzuki wasn't worried about fame so long as Studio Ghibli enjoyed their creations. However, when a distributor implied that Miyazaki would leave the company after Kiki, Suzuki immediately contacted NTV, a TV station, for funding so they could make another hit. Number 65. Miyazaki and Suzuki would often go traveling to celebrate the completion of a film. They've been to Ireland, England, and Italy, among other places. When they'd return to the studio for the next project, Miyazaki would have incorporated the landscapes they've seen 
scene in the film. Number 66. The first foreign country that Miyazaki visited was Sweden. It was back when he was trying to get the rights to make a Pippi Longstockings movie. Though he didn't secure the rights, he loved the landscapes he saw and later incorporated them into Kiki. Number 67. Suzuki says that the reason he and Miyazaki have remained friends for so long, for decades to be precise, is because they never dwell on the past. They only discuss the present or the future. In fact, they didn't even realize it was Ghibli's 20th anniversary when it came up. Number 68. Isao Takahata used to lead an animation school in Studio Ghibli, where junior staff members would learn about the arts of directing and animation. However, they found that great filmmakers do not necessarily make great teachers. Number 69. Ghibli animators used to make half the average salary in Japan. This is because industry standards are to paper pieces drawn, which among a large team is not many. So Miyazaki came up with a solution. Employ animators full-time with a fixed salary and regularly recruit and train new staff. That sounds a lot better. Number 70. The next big Ghibli production was Only Yesterday in 1991, directed by Takahata. It became a sleeper hit, unexpectedly rocketing to number one in Japan in 1991, particularly due to its resonance with adult women. Number 71. Studio Ghibli was most pleased, not by the box office success, but by the success of Miyazaki's plan to raise the team's salaries and still make a great movie. However, this also meant that production costs doubled from here on out. To compensate for this increase, Studio Ghibli decided to finally start incorporating advertising to secure box office success. Number 72. Only Yesterday was based off a manga called Omohide Poro Poro. The original book is told as a memoir about the narrator, Taiko, at age 11, so Takahata decided to incorporate the adult Taiko, writing the memoir into the movie. Number 73. Next came Porco Rosso in 1992, the movie about a World War I pilot cursed to look like a pig, which of course means we're back to a Miyazaki movie. Number 74. Miyazaki had wanted to set the story in Croatia, but he moved it after Civil War broke out there. This made the movie more serious than he had intended, since obviously a story about a flying pig is never meant to be a serious movie. Number 75. While working on Porco Rosso, Miyazaki was under a lot of pressure, and to alleviate some of that stress, he drew a blueprint for a new studio, including picking all the construction materials. Porco Rosso and the studio both finished production at nearly the exact same time. Number 76. At the new studio, the ladies' bathroom is twice the size of the men's bathroom, despite approximately having equal male and female employees. People kind of attribute this to Miyazaki's feminism. Number 77. The studio was intentionally designed with less parking space and more greenery. Hmm. You get the feeling Miyazaki cares about the environment or something? Number 78. In 1993, Ghibli differentiated itself from all the other studios in the biz by having animation, art, painting, and photography departments all in-house. The trend was to do the exact opposite, but the studio thought it was more important to keep everyone under the same roof with a shared goal. Number 79. Whisper of the Heart, released in 1995, was directed by Yoshifumi Kondo. It was the last Ghibli film before Princess Mononoke, meaning the last film before Studio Ghibli took off as an international brand. Their hard work paid off, and Princess Mononoke was a massive hit, for real this time. Number 80. Miyazaki did write the script and do the storyboards for Whisper of the Heart, but Yoshifumi Kondo was selected to direct it so that Ghibli could branch out from their usual two directors. Kondo was the top animator at Ghibli, so he was the natural choice for the job. Number 81. Keisuke Miyazaki, Hayao's second son, created a woodcut print called Craftsman Making a Violin in Prison, which is featured in a book in Whisper of the Heart. Number 82. Miyazaki quit Ghibli in January of 1998 and built a whole new studio, Butaya, or Pig House nearby. Just one year later though, he unquit and returned to Ghibli as the new head of the office, as if he wasn't already. Number 83. Miyazaki began worrying about his aging staff, many of whom had been at Ghibli for two decades. He came up with an idea to open a shop so the animators could staff the shop part-time. They went location hunting for a place, and after picking a site that was far too big for one shop, they decided to open up a whole museum instead. You always outdo yourself, Miyazaki. Number 84. When asking for advice on how to run a museum, it was recommended that the place be quiet, dark, and not disruptive. So, in typical Ghibli fashion, Ghibli decided to do the exact opposite and open a museum that specifically caters to children. Number 85. Miyazaki designed the entire museum himself, using storyboards, as though it were a movie. He was inspired by European architecture, employing spiral staircases, bridges, and balconies all over the building's perimeter. Number 86. The museum first entered the planning phase in 1998, began construction in 2000, and opened in 2001. That's about the same amount of time it takes Ghibli to crank out a movie. Number 87. The Saturn Theater in the basement of the museum shows several Ghibli short films that are unavailable elsewhere. These include Koro's Big Walk, Water Spider Mon Mon, May and the Kitten Bus, The Day I Harvested a Star, The Whale Hunt, Looking for a Home, A Sumo Wrestler's Tale, Mr. Doe and the Egg Princess, Treasure Hunting, and coming soon, Boro the Caterpillar. Number 88. Miyazaki designed the theater keeping in mind that small children would be among the visitors. Worried that they might get scared in a dark basement, he had windows installed with shades that open up after each showing. Number 89. Since we did cover 107 facts about Spirited Away, we're going to talk about Studio Ghibli's next
next major production, Howl's Moving Castle, which quite possibly could have a 107 facts all to itself. Falling in line with Miyazaki's other recent movies, Howl's was part film, part political commentary, which may have helped him earn its place as one of Ghibli's finest. Number 90. The castle for Howl's Moving Castle, you know, the moving one, was actually not designed for the film. Miyazaki had originally drawn it to fill an empty space in the Ghibli Museum, but when it came time to design the moving castle, Suzuki recommended that they just use that one. They tack some legs on it, and bam, moving castle. Number 91. Due to Miyazaki's habit of being a control freak, Studio Ghibli was never really able to train anybody to take his place. Miyazaki had once tapped Whisper of the Heart director Yoshifumi Kondo to take his place, but tragically Kondo passed away in 1998. The studio put off making another decision on the matter for as long as possible. Number Number 92. At one point, it was thought that Goro Miyazaki may be the successor. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree in the Miyazaki family, or in this case, the child of a frog is a frog. This is what animator Otsuka Yasuo exclaimed upon seeing a storyboard by Goro and realizing that he ought to get involved in Studio Ghibli as well. Runs in the family. Number 93. Miyazaki was very critical of his son's work and was opposed to letting him direct anything. That is, until Suzuki showed him a poster that Goro drew four tails from Earthsea, which was such a powerful image that it left Miyazaki speechless. And that sounds like like a tricky thing to do. Number 94. Tales from Earthsea came out in 2006 to mixed reviews and less than outstanding success. Miyazaki still praised his son's direction with the film, but it showed that Goro was perhaps still not prepared to succeed his father. Number 95. Goro did go on to create From Up on Poppy Hill, which earned several awards and nominations, including a win for the Japan Academy Prize of Animation and a nomination at the Annie Awards. So worry not, Goro's story is not over yet. Number 96. One of the newer directors is Hiromasa Yonebayashi, who had been a Ghibli in between her artist and later directed The Secret World of Arietti. He also went on to write and direct When Marnie Was There, one of the most recent Ghibli ventures. Number 97. Miyazaki's most recent film, The Wind Rises, came out in 2014. As a biopic about a pilot, it seemed like a natural last movie for Miyazaki. Suzuki said that he was particularly excited for The Wind Rises because, if you've learned nothing else from this video, Miyazaki loves airplanes and hates war. So a movie about war hating and airplane loving is just his speed. Number 98. A 2013 documentary, The King Kingdom of Dreams and Madness is all about Studio Ghibli during the development of The Wind Rises and The Tale of Princess Kaguya, which happened simultaneously. Old habits die hard. Number 99. For those aching for more Miyazaki, don't worry, he's retired six times and come back each and every time. His recent retirement, for instance, was interrupted to work on Boro the Caterpillar, a CGI short film for the Ghibli Museum. Number 100. Studio Ghibli rarely ever uses CG since Miyazaki prefers hand-drawn animation. The first time they used it was in Palm Poco for a pan of the library shelves. Drawing this pan by hand would have been doable, but offered no creative value, so they opted for CG just to simplify it. Number 101. Miyazaki tends to dislike the storytelling in modern Disney films. He prefers the early short films, such as Silly Symphonies. Suzuki, on the other hand, raved about Disney's Zootopia. Number 102. The geniuses at Studio Ghibli and Pixar Animation Studios have an animation bromance. John Lasseter and Hayao Miyazaki are friends, and have been known to praise and visit each other, talent recognizing other talent. Ghibli even gave Lasseter the head of the cat bus from the Ghibli Museum as a gift. Number 103. There's some fan speculation that Studio Ghibli movies are actually connected. They mainly point to the shared themes and lore of some of the movies as bridges, sort of like the Pixar theory, but not nearly as conspiratory. You can see those theories in our cartoon conspiracy videos, which we'll leave in their hands to explain. Number 104. In addition to full-length features, Studio Ghibli has produced several short films, such as Iblar Jikan, The Night of Tana Yamagahara, and Ghibli's. Number 105. Four of the top 10 highest grossing movies in Japan are Studio Ghibli films, Spirited Away, Princess Mononoke, Okay, Ponyo, and Howl's Moving Castle. Number 106. Studio Ghibli not only brings home the green, but also the gold. They've won the Japanese Academy Prize for Best Picture for Princess Mononoke in 1997 and Spirited Away in 2001, as well as the Animation of the Year Award for Ponyo on the Cliff by the Sea in 2009, Ariadne in 2011, From Up on Poppy Hill in 2012, and The Wind Rises in 2014. Number 107. In 2002, Spirited Away became the first foreign movie to win Best Animated Feature at the Academy Awards. Thanks for watching 107 Facts about Studio Ghibli. Are there Ghibli films that you love that we didn't cover here? Any that you want a 107 Facts video on? Let us know in the comments below. We have new videos dropping every week, so let us know which animated film or TV show you want us to cover next. And if you like getting more from your cartoons, subscribe to Channel Frederator, because remember, Frederator loves you.